Where should I start? I, I actually have no idea where to start because we are preparing this exhibition and we, it's not me and myself, but uh, uh, me and my friends, my collaborators, my students are preparing this exhibition for six years now. Actually, we started in 2009, the end of 2009. The first ideas came up of uh, uh, having a, a special exhibition uh, as a result of this 500 years uh, anniversary of uh, the Utopia, published not by coincidence, but mm, a little bit by coincidence, in Leuven. Leuven was in the beginning of the 16th century, really a very important center for the humanist movement, you can say, for the humanist ideas. Most important uh, uh, person there was, of course, Erasmus van Rotterdam, huh? Erasmus, who was teaching there and who was not yet chased away, because just before the problems with Protestants and, and Catholics uh, came on, and, and after that, uh, Erasmus uh, left uh, the city. But in 2016, he was alive and kicking in Leuven, and his uh, personal, so to speak, his personal publisher, Dirk Martens, who was the first, actually, to publish a book in the Netherlands uh, much earlier, came from Aalst, went to Antwerp, and then at the end he went to Leuven, because there he had his clientele. He published his book in 1516, right in the center of the city. We know almost exactly where, not, not, not precisely, but we have an idea where this printing press was located. So it's 500 years ago, and I always say and start this uh, uh, course, I must say, because I never had this for a public. It's the first time you have a, you have a, uh, this is the first time I do this for, for a public. I, I do it for, for students, but then I talk for nine hours. I mean, not, <laughs> <coughs> it's true. Three times three hours. Just to explain what I, what we are talking about. So I will let it be a little bit short. Uh, anyway, uh, um, I forgot what I was uh, not starting. Anyway, in search of utopia, in search of utopia, and we are talking about, or we are starting about this book. And I know again what I wanted to say. This book, very little book. There are 20 copies left in the world or so. Two of them are in Belgium, in Brussels. Uh, is, you can say, the most important, at least the most influential book in published in Leuven anyway, maybe in the Netherlands, possibly in the Netherlands, and one of the most influential books, most important books, it's really a cultural marker in European history, Utopia, Utopos, Utopia, without place. And this word is invented by Thomas More, Thomas Morus, or Thomas More, who was, together with his good friend Erasmus, who was one of the leading people, leading humanists, leading thinkers in the Europe of the end of the 15th and the beginning of the 16th century. He lived in, in, in London. Long story, he was in Antwerp at a certain point, in, two, in, in 1515, and there he met, we don't know who he met, and we will see it in a minute. Anyway, they talked about the idea of, let's imagine, you must really see it as some friends, Erasmus, Peter Gillis, an Antwerp humanist, Thomas Morris, sitting around a table and thinking about, let's imagine an ideal society. And let's start with how bad it is today. There are a lot of problems in Europe in 1515, and they talk about it, and then they say, but there is an alternative. And it, it's a kind of, this is what it's all about. Utopia, utopos, no place, or eutopos, the good place. E means in Greek, good. So good place or no place. Utopi, the word utopia, comes from this book. So that's the starting point. <clears throat> but we go far farther. We don't, it's impossible or it, it would be a little bit boring to illustrate the book because it, it's not illustrated before the 18th century. In the 18th century it was illustrated. But we have four teams selected after five years, six years of preparation. The first team is the book. Libellus Fere Aureus Utopia. This is the, the first sentence. It's, it's a, the golden book, Utopia. 
That's the first thing. Leuven, why Leuven, humanists. The second uh, point we are focusing on is in search of utopia. So we are not trying to reconstruct the ideas that consist uh, or that, that are explained in this book, but we are trying to look at people around 1500, very important moment in history. America was just about to be discovered. They, actually, they didn't know anything about it, just some lines of the coasts. Africa was unknown. Asia was almost unknown. And it starts all around 1500. They start to... So people are looking for utopia, looking for new horizons. That's the third part. I will come back to the second part in a minute. Beyond the horizon, terra incognita. And I thought always that the Terra Foundation had something to do with terra incognita. <laughs> <laughs> you, you took my line. <laughs> anyway, terra incognita, the unknown Terra Foundation. And uh, the second part is the imagination. Imagination is extremely important for art, for discoveries, for science. Phantasms. What's, what are people thinking? And I will explain it in a minute. And then the fourth part is structuring chaos, holding the universe. And it is the beginning of people wondering where are we in the universe? Who are we? When, uh, what's time, for instance? That are the four parts we are discovering or we are focusing on. The first is a book and I have to go a little bit faster or a little bit uh, yeah, faster. Uh, the book I explained already, it is written by this man, uh, Thomas More, and what I show you in, in, the, in the slides, it's only one third or so, or one quarter of the exhibition, it's, everything is, will be in Leuven in the end of this uh, of the year. So the portrait of this, uh, this man is of course important, and this uh, uh, um, uh, diptych, uh, with Erasmus and Peter Gillis. They are two friends, and it's very rare that we have a diptych with two men in the 16th century. Mostly it's, it's men and women, of course. Uh, two men together. It's a friendship dip, a friendships diptych. Uh, they, and it's made especially for Thomas Morris. Uh, uh, the left part is Erasmus, the famous Erasmus. The right part is the famous Peter Gillis. Two friends, and together with Thomas Morris, uh, they form this Triumvirate, the, the, the three good friends coming together in Antwerp and discussing about utopia and a lot of other things. We know this because there are a lot of letters uh, left. This one comes from Rome. Yeah, the left one, the, the right one come from, comes from Antwerp and it took us six year, five years actually to bring them together because it was quite <coughs> a difficult uh, negotiation but between brackets. Of course, we will focus, and I will not explain everything, but some of the highlights of the exhibition. This is maybe the most impressive portrait in 16th century Flemish art. It's a portrait of, an, unfortunately, an unknown scholar, and I hope to identify, but it's impossible. So it's an unknown scholar, an unknown humanist anyway, and we can, we can know this from the, 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 uh, the uniform he is wearing. Uh, Quinton Matzeis. And I think originally this could could have been a diptych also, and uh, uh, but it's it's a very very fascinating portrait because of the gesture of this man. He is looking at something, and I think he looked at a crucifixion, but I'm not sure. Anyway, so this will come. It's from uh, Frankfurt, and this drawing of uh, uh, of Dürer, also of an unknown professor, possibly of the Love University. At that time, we don't know who it, who, it, who it is, but Albrecht Dürer's portrait of a humanist will also be there. <coughs> That's in the first part. The second part <coughs> is uh, imaginary worlds, phantasms. And phantasms, of course, we all have ideas in our head, fan ideal worlds. Uh, and these ideal worlds take form, in, in they, are, they have different forms. First of all, I think of the Garden of Earthly Delight, and you've, you've all seen the opening of the Bosch exhibition. We have also Boschian things in the exhibition, and then closed gardens. I will explain in a minute what this is. Then, secondly, the Garden of Eden. This is a phantasm, of course. Some place, somewhere, in some time, 
where it is ideal to live. And then, of course, dystopia. Dystopia is the opposite of utopia. You can't have utopia without dystopia. You can't have day without a night. So it's a couple dystopia. It's the hell. It's the anti-utopia. And it starts with it, this uh, festival of the arches. I may not go into too, de too deep eh? because I'm, I'm, it's, I, can, I can talk for more than an hour on this painting alone. It's really very important. It's a very big, it's a large painting, 1493, very early Antwerp painting uh, made by the master of Frankfurt, which is an Antwerp painter. And this is an enclosed garden. You see the enclosed, you see the, this is the garden. It's, it's a fence. It's closed here. The, 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 the door is closed. People are having, uh, have a, a good time. It's a locus amoinus. It means people are making love in, inside. And you see here, and this is very, very, uh, it's, it happens today in Europe. People are trying to come in. This is typical for the enclosed garden. So people try to participate in this utopian world where everything is love eh? uh, and everything is at peace. They try to come in, but they are not allowed. Eh? You see here and you see there, people are not allowed to come in. If, uh, in they are not allowed to come into Europe, you can say. But anyway, this is 15th century. It's a very beautiful picture with a very, uh, uh, very recent actually uh, history proves that this is still true. This is the same idea, Romain de la Rose, uh, the master of the prayer books uh, of uh, around 1500 from the uh, British Library, where you see the same idea. Hmm? Uh, it's a, it's a, this in this uh, it's an enclosed garden. Hmm? You see it there. People are trying to come in. They are not allowed to. The, 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 the door is closed. But inside you have the locus amoeus, the place where, the utopian place where it is good to live. <clears throat> and then at the end we have also Bosch or Hieronymus Bosch, but not, of course, not a painting of the Garden of the Earthly Delight, but this tapestry coming from the Patrimonio Nacional in, uh, in, the, in the Escorial. And maybe what I'm showing you here, this is maybe the most important, or at least the most shocking, <laughs> most striking part of the whole exhibition. Enclosed gardens, completely unknown to the public, and we have seven of these uh, uh, enclosed gardens in Mechelen, a city not far from Leuven. It's uh, uh, it's made in, an, in a cloister uh, by nuns. It's much bigger than what, what you see here. You see 190 centimeters large. Uh, it's quite impressive, and uh, we have now a an, uh, an, an restoration campaign with eight specialist restorers for four years already to restore though three of the seven and three of the seven enclosed gardens will be there. It's the same idea, an enclosed garden, but this time not profane. Oh, this time not profane, but oh, I'm running out of time. Um, but uh, religious, I will go on. Same example here. <clears throat> and then the Garden of Eden, of course, with Simon Marmillon, very, very uh, well known uh, book illumination from Brussels. And this Harry uh, Bless from Amsterdam, uh, an, a tondo, uh, a round painting uh, with the, the Garden of Eden, with a lot of explanation. <laughs> but I go on. And this is the Dystopia, and I, I selected uh, also, of course, the, the works that are coming from United States, the Metropolitan. Uh, this one, an anonymous, very strange. It's anonymous. It's it's a it's a superb work. It's 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 a pity that, that we don't know who it painted actually, but it's Christ in Limbo, of course, uh, the 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 hell, uh, and it's the anti-utopian world. This is coming from the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, La Vision de Chevalier Tondal. I don't have time to explain the whole story, but uh, uh, he is entering in the hell, and you see it left uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this very beautiful uh, book illumination, Valenciennes and Ghent, uh, the end of the 15th century. And then we come to Terra, uh, to, sorry, to the Beyond the Horizon Terra Incognita. Uh, the point here is. We will not speak about, and now we come to America. We will not, I will not speak about the actual discoveries, not uh, the fact that, that Columbus sailed to whatever, to India and discovered America or Americo Vespucci. 
we will not talk about him or, or those uh, discoverers, but we will talk about imagination. It, it's about imagination, the idea that something is there. Huh? And I always say that it's because Columbus uh, had this idea of finding something, India and species and, 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 and uh, spices and, 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 and gold and so on, that he started his traveling. He found something completely different. But it's about the imagination. And what you see here, it's the so-called landing of Vasco da Gama in India. It's a very large tapestry, four meters on seven meters and uh, almost eight meters. With, where you see the, the, the shipping of exotic animals, the shipping of a unicorn and so on. And here you see the, the meeting of the king of India and possibly so-called so -called Vasco, uh, Vasco da Gama. It's, of course, it's, it's, it's fake. Eh? It's not history. It's imagination. The same thing is true with the imagination of the world. Where are we on the world? And Jean Moncel, this is La Fleur des Histoires, is a world famous uh, book illumination. If, if you see a book on, on, on cartography, always this, this uh, uh, book illumination will be in it. It's the three continents. It's before the discovery of America. It's before, of course, before uh, Australia, long before. And it's on, on base of Ptolemaeus. And Ptolemaeus is this classic Greek eh, scientist and in combination also with the Old Testament. So this was the idea of the world in the 15th century. But when we look one century later, this is 1550. Uh, it's a map that belonged to the French king and it's now in the British Library in, uh, in London. It's very large. It's a very large thing, two meters and, and 19 centimeters. And you can walk around. Huh? You can walk around and we will do it. So you, you walk around and you always see the world not upside down, because you see, it's filled with images, it's filled with fantasy. It's, it's, it's completely, uh, because they had no clue eh, what was in, in America, what was in Africa, only fantasy. And of course, also mines, eh, gold, gold mines and silver mines and so on were indicated on this map that was used as a political instrument. The king, in this case, was explained how the ships would travel to America, how they would travel to India. And there were also atlases. Atlases, not printed atlases, that's too early. It comes a little bit later. But uh, manuscript atlases, this is the map, the, I think the earliest map of Brazil, uh, around 1519, uh, very early, uh, where you can see it's a portolan. Uh, this means that the, the the, the coastline is quite well known, but the interior is unknown, except what you see here is the harvesting by, <coughs> today we say Native Americans, in the beginning of the 16th century, they were called Indians, of course, uh, and uh, the, the harvesting of the so-called Brazil wood, and Brazil wood is a very expensive uh, wood uh, that uh, uh, contains uh, red color, and that you see here. And we found in, in France, we found, we found when you see it, so the iconography there, harvesting of this extremely expensive wood. So it, it's indicated somewhere in Brazil. We had no clue where it was exactly, of course, but it's indicated. When we see here in uh, Rouen, uh, two wooden uh, uh, sculptures, uh, also quite large, uh, used or uh, uh, it, it was uh, mounted in a house of a very rich owner of ships in the beginning, beginning first half of the 16th century, where we see the same harvesting of uh, Brazil wood. There it is uh, harvested, and then it's, it's taken to the ship, and, and it sails to uh, to Rouen, uh, and, and there it is, it is uh, sold. Interesting here, in fact, it's, it's a very interesting uh, iconography, <clears throat> but there is something happening here, because when we look at this image, we see that <clears throat> in the 16th century, in the beginning of the 16th century, when people didn't know how our Indians looked like, how original people looked like, had no idea. There were rumors, there were stories, there were some letters of Columbus, there were some letters of uh, Vasco, uh, of uh, Americo Vespucci. Hmm? They had some ideas, but actually they didn't know. <clears throat> so what this, this, uh, 
artists do, he takes, he goes to another utopia, not in a distance, but in an historical distance. He goes back to the classical times and he takes this, for instance, Hercules uh, carrying the pillars. And we see an example here yeah, of uh, Aldegrever. It's a little bit later, but the, 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 the idea existed already earlier, also in sculpture. <coughs> We see that he that this sculpture is actually going back eh, to uh, a distant in history. Okay. Another example. This is the so-called uh, Dauphin Atlas, a very important atlas in the Hague. It's the same eh, uh, as the previous one, but uh, for us upside down. The north is is uh, south, and the, and the south is north because north and south were not yet eh, defined. Eh? It's just a convention. There is no up and down, of course, in in universe, but uh, uh, this is also Brazil. Oh, <clears throat> one of the earliest uh, uh, representations of an Indian. Uh, I've put in between brackets, of course, a colored woodcut, a unique uh, copy uh, in in Berlin, as far as I know, unique copy. Interesting is this because, and I'm very sure. Try to be short, but uh, here we have another movement. So one here, uh, the Jan Mostart. This is a rather unknown painting by Jan Mostart in a private collection in the United uh, in, in in England. Um, try to go back in history. He tries to to represent Eve uh, and the education of Cain and Abel. So from the Old Testament, <clears throat> that more than two children and the representation of the children of Eve. And they knew it was far away in history. He goes here, he goes to the model he had of this Indian. Uh, it's the same, they are dressed as, as people from America. And they, they knew already, they had already this, this feathers. And they, they were already in Brussels from the beginning of the 16th century. So we see here uh, again a contamination actually of uh, the, of imagination, reality, and history. And then, for the end, holding the universe, structuring chaos and eternity, but I'm, I'm afraid I have no time anymore to explain. Uh, uh, holding the universe is, of course, the idea, that especially in Leuven, actually, uh, it was quite well known for this idea, the representation of the universe. Uh, and today it's, it's still very relevant, the question of how does the universe look like. Uh, and this question starts, in a way, in the 16th century. We have here the portrait of Gemma Frisius, a very beautiful thing from Rotterdam, Boymans, uh, Martin van Heemskerk, uh, and then, of course, very early, uh, Albrecht Dürer, Northern uh, Hemisphere, but also the Southern Hemisphere. So the representation of the stars. Eh? Uh, this is an old tradition, of course, but here we see Albrecht Dürer and other scientists uh, uh, trying to do it as <coughs> correct as possible. I'm very pleased that we have this one. It's 1502. Uh, this is the earliest known European uh, a the so a uh, celestial globe. Right? It's very large. It's uh, uh, 70 centimeters, like this something. Yeah? It's, it's almost life size here. Uh, it's from the Deco Ecouen, not far from from Paris. It's dated 1502. And then we have this little girl. This little girl will be the the, the image of the campaign, and she's holding the universe upside down. It's a long explanation, but it's uh, probably a an, an princess from Denmark, painted by uh, Jan Gossaert, and she's holding this armillarium, an armillarium sphere, and this is the representation of the universe made in Leuven in the the middle of the 16th century, this is 1530, so around those days they were actually making those representations of the universe. And I have one example, but there are seven in the world left, so we, we will bring them back, not all together, but I hope seven, uh, six of the seven. This is this comes from Chicago, uh, Armarily Sphere, it's inventory number one. So the Earth is in the center, and you have the the spheres of the, the the planets and the and the stars surrounding the, the earth of course at that moment uh, 
uh, some people knew already that the earth was not in the center, but this goes on, of course. I think even that in the 18th century that this idea goes on. Very beautiful objects. Structuring chaos. This is also coming from United States. It's uh, Texan, Arizona, University of Arizona, one of the most striking and confusing iconographical representation. That is chaos, and that's the only painting I know actually that is re that is from the end of the 15th century that is representing chaos. And so the painting of chaos. I don't have time, unfortunately, to explain this iconography. But chaos is ordered, huh? so we have, and today still we do, we do, we order the chaos. Huh? Uh, last week we had this discovery of this uh, very strange waves, uh, and uh, but they started it in the 15th, in the 16th century. So we have here uh, an angel uh, structuring the, the the heavens with an astrolabium. So you see here an astrolabium, an uh, astrolabe. Also, Leuven, uh, Leuven made. This comes from Madrid Museo Archeologico, uh, made by Zeilst. Uh, uh, it's quite late. It's 1569. The only one with an, with, which is still complete, uh, uh, an astrolabium uh, to, to, to uh, define your position on the earth. And on time, and I have to, to close now. Time. <clears throat> what is time and uh, uh, how people <clears throat> thought about time, and of course time was in the 16th century a cycle, a cycle which is represented, for instance, here by Simon Bening. Simon Bening was much older than Bruegel, huh? uh, at least 25 years older than Bruegel. Uh, he is representing uh, time as uh, the, the works, as we call it, the works of the months. Huh? So the months are represented and then an ever-continuing story. And this is the last one. Uh, uh, astronomy uh, uh, tapestry from Flanders around 15, 10, 15, 15 comes from Sweden. Uh, people looking up in the, at the stars and asking themselves, where are we and who are we? And we see here uh, astronomia, uh, the personification of astronomia, looking up at the stars and some scientists looking up at the stars and asking themselves, where are we and what are we doing here? And that's the last the last uh, image of this uh, exhibition. I'm sorry that I over, I, I talk too long actually. Anyway, thank you very much. So I'll say a few things uh, speaking to some of the themes that were in Jan's talk. Um, also with an eye to uh, talking more directly about the relationship between Dutch and American art. And so I hope this doesn't seem too contrived, uh, like an advertisement for the rest of the series. Uh, it's actually a very interesting kind of constraint that was described to me, utopia, uh, uh, Dutch-American artistic relationships. Um, and I also think about Americans looking to Europe. So a lot of what we're seeing here is um, uh, the new world in the European imaginary. And a lot of what I have to say is Americans looking back to Europe to think about utopia. Um, so you already saw a version of this image from the first edition of Utopia, printed in Leuven in uh, 1516, the famous map and the alphabet. Um, I wanted to start in the early modern period itself, uh, specifically with some things that Carlo Ginzburg, the famous uh, Italian historian has to say about Utopia in a book published in 2000 called No Island is an Island. Um, and Ginsburg is interested in uh, kind of reframing, rethinking about what kind of text exactly Utopia is. Um, he looks not only at the first edition, but uh, across early editions to talk about textual differences, kind of exercise in looking at the material history of text. We have not one Utopia but many different versions of Utopia. Um, the second edition is the Paris edition uh, from 1517. And in that edition, the word Festivus is used in the title, which is usually translated uh, as playful or entertaining. And he kind of takes off from here to think about the work is not this super serious or not only serious work of political philosophy, uh, but something that combines the serious and the playful uh, together. 
Um, one of the things that he considers as he's looking at the work is the relationship between the kind of text proper of Utopia, the, the famous content of Utopia, and the framing texts, or what he calls paratexts, that are bound together with it. So this can be poems, introductory poems, testimonials in the form of letters, um, uh, maps, alphabets, and even interior to the text, uh, things like little jokes, things that deserve closer look uh, than they had received <clears throat> to that point in time. So, for example, in the first edition of the text, he looks at a uh, uh, poem and a letter, uh, both of which relate utopia uh, to a painting and Thomas More's practice of writing uh, to that of a painter. And there's a whole tradition from very early on thinking about these uh, uh, terms, uh, art, more as an artist, more as a painter. Uh, one of the poems talks about utopia vanquishing Plato's Republic in the same way that a real thing vanquishes a pictorial description. Uh, but then you have other letters where Moore is described as a painter and his book is a painting. And so utopia exists between this sort of uh, super painterly state, something so well painted it's real, <laughs> and paintings kind of flatter uh, image. Um, one of the other points that Ginsburg makes in relation to this sense of it, the text as both uh, uh, playful and serious, is that uh, we might see it uh, in relationship to revival, a humanist revival in the writings of the Greek rhetorician and satirist Lucian from this period who more translates and uh, Utopia is sometimes bound together with Lucian's writings. And so looking beyond uh, the, the text proper to this other kind of framing, uh, framing mechanism. Uh, one of the other things that Ginsburg does, and he's following Stephen Greenblatt and doing this. Stephen Greenblatt has a really brilliant reading of Thomas More's Utopia in relationship to Hans Holbein's ambassadors, where he thinks about the ambassadors as a way of getting into utopia, as being similar kinds of works. Ginsburg kind of is inspired by what he you know, describes as Greenblatt's brilliant usage of Holbein to compare this painting that I'm showing you, which is this amazing Petrus Christus in the Met, a portrait of a Carthusian monk from 1446, which he says is one of the kinds of things that more might have seen when he was on the continent uh, as he's writing and then eventually having published Utopia. And so the painting is used in a number of different ways. He starts out by talking about how uh, jokes that are included in the text, including the most famous of the jokes, which is that nobody knows the location of Utopia because uh, during a moment when uh, this is going to be narrated, someone coughs. And, uh, it, and so it remains unknown. So Ginsburg compares uh, in the painting on the screen, the fly on the frame, which is kind of uh, part of a tradition of this sort of trompe l'oeil. I don't know if this has an, an um, the fly. No, you, 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 can't, you can't point to the Yeah, the, the, fly, the, the fly on the frame. Uh, tradition uh, in, in trompe l'oeil painting is something like the cough that's heard in the text. Um, and he's interested in the painting primarily as uh, something that stages a tension between the real and the fictitious. Uh, painting that's a tremendous essay, early oil painting um, in Verism in the 15th century, um, but that announces itself as painting through these kinds of trompe l'oeil devices. And so part of a much longer history of a dialectical kind of image that announces itself as both amazingly true and fictitious at the same time. So to jump ahead, and we look at a few moments from the history of American art in relation to utopia. The 19th century in particular is this amazing uh, moment of experimentation with utopias, the founding of utopias in the United States. One famous instance of this is the Fruitlands Utopia, which you can visit a uh, kind of museum associated with it in Massachusetts now. And the, uh, the red building in the distance is the remaining farmhouse from the utopia, organized in 1843, and then it lasts not even a year uh, before it fails. So variously described as a socialist experiment and anarchistic experiment. Um, 
And in thinking about the theme uh, uh, of this talk, I was reminded because I'm an enthusiast of all things related to Concord, Massachusetts, and uh, the Alcott family, uh, on whom I've worked a little bit in, in my art historical research, of this line in Abigail Alcott's diary about her husband, Bronson Alcott, you see her, that's Abigail Alcott, um, the way he's trying to drum up support for the Fruitlands utopia when he travels to England. And what she says in her diary is, quote, Mr. Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, was greatly apprehensive, uh, having funded Alcott to go to England, that Mr. Alcott had dipped his pencil in Rembrandt's pot of gay coloring, and that his friends would find themselves in a barren field with no sun to cheer them. So he's trying to get people to sign up for his utopia when he goes to England. Um, and he does get some people to come back. And I thought this was kind of uh, an aside, although something maybe like uh, uh, the fly on the frame or the cough, an offhanded remark, um, uh, in which an early moment when utopia is being thought about in relationship to Dutch art, Rembrandt very particularly, um, it may seem, and is maybe the case, that Abigail had never seen a Rembrandt painting in her life. Uh, her description of Rembrandt uh, as somebody who's involved in gay coloring doesn't really seem right. We might talk about colorism, not gay coloring, probably. Um, but is a moment where Rembrandt becomes this sort of model and anti-model for truth uh, and utopia. Um, Rembrandt is somebody painting an optimistic picture, but a picture nevertheless and one that is potentially misleading. Um, if you continue to look at Dutch-American relations through the late 19th into the early 20th century, there are many other instances in which so-called so golden age Dutch painting uh, is a framework for thinking about utopia. And I just wanted to mention one, it's one that hasn't really been studied very much. Uh, so specifically, uh, Charles Caffin, who's an art writer associated with the Stieglitz Circle, publishes this remarkable book in 1913 called Art for Life's Sake, um, in which he's trying to kind of, uh, having studied art all his life, take everything that he's learned and think about uh, how the study of art could actually help you develop a theory of the art of the living, right? So he'd written all these popular books, including a book called The Story of Dutch Painting in 1909, not the kind of thing art historians have studied almost at all, um, but then writes this interesting work of theory. Uh, the center of this work is based on his enthusiasm for 17th century Dutch art. And uh, I won't have time to talk about this fully, but the term that he uses for uh, 17th century Dutch art as a model for an early 20th century art of living, a kind of utopian project, is scientific artistic organization. Uh, this is a term that he takes very directly uh, almost from writings on Taylorist managerial culture in the early 20th century. So development of a kind of uh, 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 ethic of non-wasteful labor um, uh, associated with Frederick Winslow Taylor. And this early modern Dutch art is important to Caffin, even in, to the extent that you, know, you might talk about there being some idealism in it that it's a combination of empiricism, practicality, and idealism. Um, he says, their idealism was not directed toward imagining a life of unattainable perfection, but expended in making the conditions of actual everyday life as perfect as possible. Uh, and he also kind of underlines that reformed faith associated with early modern Dutch culture is a key ingredient. He has a lot of kind of almost quasi-racist things to say about Italian artistic culture uh, in the book. So strangely, he doesn't kind of pick up on how Holland and the United States may have similar kinds of relationships in terms of, say, the early development of capitalism or global imperialism. Um, it's very kind of particular and idiosyncratic uh, uh, use of Holland. So he uses very particular painters as examples. Uh, for example, Franz Hals is, for him, uh, the very kind of pinnacle of efficiency in the Taylorist sense. Efficiency is this word he uses all the time, um, suggesting that we could see almost uh, Taylorist uh, social and economic organization laid out in a, in a Franz Hall's painting from this earlier time. Um, he speaks vociferously against aristocracy and on behalf of democracy, 
Uh, but he's certainly not rejecting capitalism. One of the things we'll see in a lot of what remains kind of critique of capitalism being critical to any utopian project. That's not really the case uh, for Caffin. So uh, Rembrandt, uh, by comparison to Halls, is somebody who combines the ideal and the real, um, this amazing sort of mix. He penetrates the material envelope and reaches into the soul of facts, he says. Um, looking at the separate Emmaus, um, he carries no outward evidence of superiority describing Christ in this painting in the Louvre. Um, but uh, uh, indeed, the, the eyes in the eyes of any man or woman, who for the time being is forgotten self in the absorbed enthusiasm of bettering humanity, you can see this in Christ. And he includes social workers, firemen, surgeons among the people who are making the world a better place. Um, Vermeer is one of the other artists he talks about. This kind of painting uh, entered the Met uh, in this period of Vermeer mania. Um, and Vermeer expresses the kindly and pleasant reasonableness that may inform the relations of everyday life and its surroundings. And he suggests that Rembrandt, Vermeer artists like this are modeling a just social ecology. And he uses these ecological terms, relations, relativity of values throughout his writing. So to be sure, the Vermeer painting on the screen is still hierarchical in a kind of compositional sense, but that doesn't really matter to Caffin. Um, he's not someone like later uh, avant-garde painters in the 20th century who are calling compositional hierarchy itself into question, trying to model utopia through the disruption of, say, uh, 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 centralized organization of a picture, compositional subordination. It takes an artist like Mondrian, uh, maybe to be doing this composition number 10, Pure and Ocean, a work that's uh, one early kind of example of the mod modeling of the disruption of hierarchy. And so Mondrian, uh, who, as we all know, goes at the end of his life to the United States, an artist who's looking toward the universal, toward the abolishment of hierarchy and centrality, to arrive at something like Yves Lambois' word, a timeless equilibrium, uh, with an emphasis on becoming rather than being, and also, according to Bois, a sort of dialectical jump from extreme idealism to extreme materialism, uh, the opposition of figuring ground being abolished to arrive at a more pure abstraction. This kind of Mondrian painting plays a very important role in the kind of development, I think, of utopian painting in the 20th century. Uh, Leo Steinberg, in Other Criteria in 1972, singles it out as part of a genealogy of horizontally oriented, or we could say horizon oriented works, pick up on a term that was important to Jan, um, that uh, begin with someone like Mondrian and then lead up and through an artist like Rauschenberg with his flatbed related uh, 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 combines. And so I was thinking about this idea of the horizon and horizontality um, in relation to what Jan told me he would talk about and reminded of something I'd been reading in my research. Louis Moran, this great essay translated into English in 1993, actually isolates the figure of the horizon as what utopia is. This is a statement. Utopia is the figure of the horizon. And so the genealogy leads through Monet's water lilies, like the ones in the Orangerie, uh, horizontally oriented garden landscapes, indeed horizonless landscapes, uh, a move toward an adequation of the horizontal pond surface with the picture of plain, um, as if utopia had arrived and no more figure of utopia's horizon were necessary. And Steinberg also <laughs> traces this through Rauschenberg's early projects, including his Edenic large format photograms made on exposed blueprint paper, the one you see here. These are very big blue images. That was his partner, Susan Weil, at the time. As well as you know, famous works to pick up on a Dutch-American connection, his erased de Koenig drawing from 1953, in which he carefully presses down horizontally on a de Koenig, uh, erasing it and then claiming it as his own work. Uh, we see here, too, in Rauschenberg, an artist who's staging in his early work 
uh, kind of clash of what we would call blueprint utopias and iconoclastic utopias. This is uh, terminology used by Russell Jacobi in a book called Picture Imperfect. He says there are two kinds of utopias, iconoclastic utopias that are imaginary and blueprint utopias that are kind of more with a foot in the real. And Rauschenberg's work, I think, confounds uh, this binary. So Steinberg goes on to talk about the combines, which though they're hung on the wall, he says, such pictures kept referring back to the horizontals on which we walk and sit, work and sleep. Uh, one of the most important early ones is Rauschenberg's own bed uh, that he's picked up off the horizontal and put vertically on the wall where you see objects bedding themselves down and the work surface. And as time goes on, more and more images bedding themselves down. Um, so Steinberg talks about the flat bedding on which we do our begetting, conceiving, and dreaming. So he also emphasizes that more than, than art and composition and picture planes are at stake in this, uh, this work is part of a shakeup which contaminates all purified categories, the deepening inroads of art into non-art, leaving the old standby criteria to rule an eluding an eroding plane, he says. In this issue of contamination, a utopia of contamination, not a utopia of purity, I think is really uh, interesting. Indeed, not just Steinberg, but other artists uh, uh, and art historians looking at Rauschenberg's work have talked about his work from the 50s into the 60s as engaged with what we might call, and this is Brian O'Doherty's term, the utopia of the now, right? Rather than utopia being future images. Uh, kind of present-oriented utopia. And so with Mondrian, we also, looking at his later works, like New York City 1 from 1942, he does a lot of late works that are very specifically about New York City, um, uh, continues onward in the development of this dialectics in Bois terms, the balancing of the vertical by the horizontal, non-hierarchical square formats, creating a new, equilibri new equilibrium in tension uh, with his neoplasticist works. Uh, in his own kind of accounts of the works and, and some of his most important interpreters like Blois, um, you often read about the expansive force of his paintings, their potential to transform the environment beyond their boundaries, correcting the ugliness around them. And these kinds of late works Bois also talks about is bringing painting toward drawing. And he has more writing on horizontalization in art than uh, anyone probably ever wants to read, I learned uh, in preparing this. Um, I'm also interested in thinking about Mondrian's relevance to this subject and those people who are taking up Mondrian, doing kind of quirky things with him. Um, in the US, in the period when Mondrian comes, during World War II, you have Jacob Lawrence in his migration series making paintings like this. So very obviously kind of indebted to Mondrian's earlier, some of his earlier paintings as well as his late paintings. Um, maybe not fully utopian, but a painting that's entitled After Arriving North, the Negroes Had Better Housing Conditions. So the North as a kind of site of something uh, improved. And his late paintings like Broadway Boogie Woogie look a lot more like this. Um, Jacob Lawrence. Um, if we were going to talk more, and we won't have time, about Mondrian's relevance to the Americas as a whole, I think it's an interesting question for this series is, you know, do we mean the United States? Do we mean the entire hemisphere? We'd also need to look at, say, the Brazilian artist Elia Oitisica. Uh, this is a 1965 work called Glass Belide, Five Homage to Mondrian. It's in the Tate Modern. Uh, in which he takes Mondrian's painting into a third dimension, rounding it out, making it more real, right? And the Belide uh, is a word that means fireball uh, in Portuguese, uh, not for nothing, resembles the kind of Molotov cocktails that were a preferred uh, bomb form of anarchists in the late 19th and 20th century. And Oitisika also in his Parangoles, which are almost wearable versions of uh, Mondrian paintings, taking this further too. Uh, I wanted to mention, uh, as I'm finishing, a uh, show that's up, another uh, different kind of exhibition, but related to Yan Show, I think, uh, visiting Utopia at this moment, a uh, show called Hippie Modernism, curated by Andrew Blauvelt 
at the Walker Art Center. Um, it focuses on the 1960s and 70s and includes some very interesting uh, moments of Dutch American interaction. I wanted to talk about a couple. One is this amazing project I'd never read about until I got the catalog, um, the Heineken World Bottle Project, uh, 1963, where one of the uh, grand, a grandson of the founder of Heineken travels in the Dutch Antilles in the Caribbean and thinks really crummy there. He goes to the Dutch colony and hopes to solve the problem of both abundant garbage on the beaches, including beer bottles, maybe Heineken, uh, and lack of housing in one swoop. Um, designing this special Heineken bottle that after you drink it or even before if you want it, you can use as a brick to build uh, uh, housing. And so you don't throw it away, but you use it actually quite strong. And they make 100,000 of these uh, in the period, but really only prototype buildings were made. This is the world bottle shed that you see down below. So working with global capitalism, right, of course, this guy's part of Heineken. He's not going to, like, get rid of Heineken. Um, but then you have other uh, groups uh, that are a part of this show who are very anti-capitalism, doing things that are much more radical. The San Francisco Diggers, for example, are a group whose name is inspired by the mid-17th century English diggers, which is kind of proto-communist or uh, anarchist group uh, who... Uh, rejected existing socioeconomic hierarchies in England, practices of land ownership and enclosure, and ad advocated the restoration of the world as a commons, inspired by scriptural and apostolic models for communal living and the abolishment of private property. And th their own experiments are building on earlier experiments in uh, shared ownership and things like this, like Dutch familism, uh, the 16th century. So the diggers exist for a few years in San Francisco, and they abolish money, having their own new money inversion. It's a version of the world turned upside down. It's a, a, a famous anthem of the diggers in the 17th century that's been re-recorded a lot of times is this song called The World Turned Upside Down. Um, and so they're very much against private ownership and also uh, the fencing of property. It's very interesting, the enclosed gardens that Jan was showing. There's this whole kind of thread in the utopian stuff I've been looking at, at the getting rid of fences, right? Not kind of enclosing something, um, but getting rid of it. This group is also very closely re related to um, the Dutch provosts of the middle uh, of the 1960s. And they have this plan that's actually quite prophetic, the white bicycle plan, where everybody shares bicycles and nobody owns them, that now actually exists. So there's a lot more I could say about the diggers. They have free food. Uh, they, that freedom is their thing. Freedom is another of these important topics, I think, for this. Uh, free food events in the panhandle in San Francisco. Um, it's worth mentioning, too, that San Francisco and Amsterdam have a lot in common in this period. And the pr writing on provos and diggers talks about this, uh, where they just give out stuff for free stew in this barrel. And they frame it all with this, what they call the free frame of reference, which is this huge frame. <laughs> so that when you see what they're doing, and Peter Berg, who's one of their members, describes it this way, what you see is a painting of people acting this way. So when you drove by, you have this sort of a living painting that you're encountering. Um, this is very interesting, and Peter Berg, who's one of the key members of the group, even points out explicitly in his writing that he's inspired by a comment John Cage made that if you put a frame around anything, it becomes an artwork, right? Um, and this is a, a comment that Cage makes uh, that comes out of an argument he has in a restaurant with Willem de Kooning, who says you can't put a frame around anything and call it art. It's not sort of enough for something to be art. And they even made free frame of references uh, necklaces so you could hold it up and look at things in a different way. So I'm just about done. Um, among other things with the diggers, uh, seems to me one of the things they're modeling is the adaptation of the cocaine to utopia, right? So this is something people have written about. Is the land of cocaine something like a utopia? Is it a different sort of thing? What they're not doing, and this is a very big part of the relationship between American and Dutch art that's been studied by people like Annette Stott, 
uh, this Gary Melcher's painting called In Holland. Um, what they're not doing is imagining Holland or the Netherlands as a pure space of anti-modern utopian work. In fact, they don't like work at all, and they call work itself into question. Um, their project is much more like what's depicted in the, the most famous depiction of the cocaine, Peter Bruegel's depiction from 1567, <laughs> of people who are not working, um, of an imagined world where houses are built out of tarts, if you can see in the upper left corner, where windmills don't stand upright but lay flat on the ground in the horizontal plane. In fact, kind of a windmill missing one sail, kind of three sheets to the wind model uh, of utopia. And so this idea of America, but also cocaine as a utopia of bounty and endless consumption without work um, is very important uh, to the diggers. And we could talk more about alcohol and drug consumption and how that opens you up to freedom. Uh, it's important to them as well. The last project I wanted to mention, and this just goes to the kind of artificiality of assembling this, this talk, which is very interesting because I hadn't thought about Dutch-American relations explicitly very much. Um, is the importance of actually adding other terms to the sort of Dutch American binary. And so, you know, in this talk, England is important, France is important. Um, one of the other artists I was thinking of with this project, Thomas Hirschhorn, a contemporary Swiss artist, um, seems quite relevant for rehearsing uh, Utopia himself, um, would be somebody else I'd mention making works like his Mondrian altar, originally built in 1997 in Geneva, and then restaged for a show at MoMA PS1 uh, in 2011-12. Um, and Hirschhorn's work, you kind of see his enthusiasm for Dutch art, Mondrian in particular. He often works in the United States, but he works other places as well. Um, this is an example of these, one of these ad hoc altars he makes for people uh, of whom he's fans. So it's not like Michael Jackson or someone like this that you usually think, oh, I'm a fan of that person, but it's like Deleuze or Bataille or Mondrian uh, instead. And um, <laughs> he's playing on words with the altar as well. So it's altar in the sense of a kind of temporary altar, but altar also A-L-T-E-R, the verb to change. And he makes these projects in different places, really in the real world, usually, not in a, a gallery space, um, and is trying to kind of build on his own sense of an irrational attachment to certain utopian projects. And so I think we would want to talk more about, two irrationality in utopia. Utopia is a version of excess. Um, his utopia, like that of Cockaine, is an excessive utopia. He always says, I want to do too much. And so he has these kind of sprawling uh, uh, works that have the aesthetic of like overconsumption uh, in the age of global capitalism. Um, so unlike the cocaine, you know, it's very rooted in the real world with the problems we have um, and precariously uh, oriented as a utopia. So I think that's what I wanted to say. Thanks for your patience.